hello everyone. Welcome to the Wheat Institute YouTube channel. We're so excited to have you here today. And today I have the pleasure of interviewing Kate Donahue, who is a psychologist and expressive arts therapist from Northern California, joining us all the way up here in Canada via Zoom. So welcome, Kate. I'm sure everyone's excited to hear from you. Well, I'm excited to do this and to participate in any way to help Wheat. So glad I'm here. Well, we're very lucky to have you. So I'm going to start off uh, by having you tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, I have a lot of years to talk about, but I'll shrink it down. <laughs> this is a funny little story from when I was young, but I remember my best friend, we would go up to my parents' attic and there were a lot of old clothes. And then outside the window of the attic, there was the roof of the shed that was slanted like this. So we would go out of the window and my girlfriend, Cecilia and I would perform for the neighborhood, which would be on one level very fun. On another level, it frightened my mother to death because she thought we would just slide off the roof. So I've always been in the arts and um, at the most part of my life. When I was uh, going to major, in um, college, I couldn't decide between psychology or art. Um, and so I majored in psychology. Coming from a working class background, I needed to get a job. And then I minored in art and in German. And um, wove in some international travel that was offered at my school and continued that. And right after I got my PhD, I got a job at an art college in Philadelphia. I lived on the East Coast um, the first part of my life. And, and there I started working with visual artists and musicians and drama people and um, and just seeing the interweaving and they would bring in their work and that would be such a rich other dimension. And when I was teaching as a teaching assistant before my PhD, I was teaching adolescent psychology and I did a little background on Eric Erickson, who I loved his theory of um, psychosocial development. And um, I discovered that he was an artist and it just made so much sense because his theory was complex and interactive and seemed very real to me. And uh, so I always brought that affinity towards the arts. And as, as I started working in this art college in Philadelphia, um, just started to weave that into my therapy work and they really taught me how to do it. And then I moved out to California and uh, found out that a whole field called expressive arts therapy that was here and in Boston. And I had heard about it, but I didn't know it well. And um, I started to teach expressive arts therapy because that's what I was really doing and then became part of the core faculty at the California Institute of Integral Studies uh, teaching in the expressive arts therapy program and was one of the core faculty founders and then I retired after about 20 some years or resigned and um, started teaching just by a fluke in other countries, in China and India and South Korea and Ghana, uh, Hong Kong. Um, and they kept inviting me back. So I've continued that not this year because as we all know, we're in a pandemic. But I just learned so much about culture and the arts and the universality of the arts in terms of 
healing. And I have a private practice in Northern California and I supervise and teach in various countries now over Zoom. Um, and that brings us up to date. Thank you for sharing. I know Lisa has been absolutely thrilled uh, that you've been to Winnipeg physically and, and via Zoom multiple times to teach. So what has brought you back to Wheat and to Winnipeg and to Canada over the years and how has your experience been? Okay. Well, I really have a, a warm place in my heart for Darcy and what she's trying to do up there in Winnipeg because you don't have much. I think you have some in Toronto and there might be something in Vancouver, but nothing in the Midwest on the prairies. So Darcy has been a pioneer in terms of thinking of this and developing things. I mean, she's come so far just in the time that I've known her. Um, she works very hard and is very devoted. And I love her concentration on indigenous people and indigenous ways of knowing. So that's one. I really have a warm place in my heart for Darcy. And I have loved the experience of being in Canada. Many Americans, when they go to Canada, or US citizens, when they go to Canada, they feel the difference. Um, now, this is my opinion between the United States and Canada, where people are in general kinder, and you also are looking at the dialogue you create. For example, one of the first things I learned about in coming to Canada was calling people who immigrated, not calling them immigrants or aliens or foreigners, but call them newcomers. And it just changes the atmosphere and the dialogue. You're welcoming them rather than keeping them at a distance with differences. Uh, then, maybe another year later, I learned that in Canada, I would be called a settler and then there would be indigenous people who were there first. And again, the dialogue changes when you realize that my people came in and settled in another person's country. And I've, I've just appreciated that mindset and the dialogue change. And um, I have loved my Canadian students. They're very bright very dedicated, um, very, it, there's a lot of passion in them and a lot of crea creativity. And so they keep drawing me back. Darcy also has allowed me to teach in ways that I, I love that accentuate my, my passions. In Winnipeg, I have really appreciated the different places I've taught and also your Human Rights Museum. I was so taken with it. Every time I visit Winnipeg, I go back and um, just look at the art and the, the interaction there of the world through a human rights lens as well as Canada. and. Um, I've appreciated that. So it's been a little love fest for me to go to Canada. It's just, I like the feel of Canada. Uh, I like the students that I've had and the welcoming sense of the Canadians. And I have a warm place in my heart for what Darcy's doing and I want to support her in that. So that's what keeps me coming back. Well, thank you for coming back. So this summer, you're going to be offering a course uh, called Dreamweaver Dreams, Young and Expressive Arts, which will be open to certificate and diploma students, as well as open for drop-in students. So what can you tell us about Dreams and Young's perspective on Dreams? Well, I uh, appreciate a lot of Carl Jung's theory. Uh, and one of his major contributions has been 
system of the dream. And I feel that all of us, with everything happening globally, we need to draw on wells of wisdom. And we actually have that available to us in our dreams. And so I really loved the term dream weaver. There was a song in the 60s or 70s, and I'm not going to sing it for you, but called dream weaver. And I thought it was great. I loved the song and I loved the, the concept and the image that it evoked. And it is what I'm trying to do with this course of look at dreams through a Jungian lens. Um, and Jung had a way of looking at life and people's experience not only on a personal level, but cultural level and archetypal or universal level. And we are now on this little planet where we can see how we're so interconnected. So it allows us to look at that. And then he created a wonderful process with dream analysis called active imagination, where you dream the dream on. And you use that through allowing your imagination to help you dream the dream on to get more of the wisdom of the dream. And one of the things that I've done over the years is married or woven together Jungian theory, an imagistic approach with expressive arts so that I take active imagination and weave in the different arts as a way of exploring the dream and dreaming the dream on. So you'll get this healing tapestry of Jung's approach, uh, some of the post-Jungian ideas, expressive arts ideas, to create what I call a healing tapestry of understanding the wisdom of the dream. And I think we need to go inside when things are so active and confusing in the outer world. So that's why I think this would be a great class we live in, because we need to tap in to our inner strength. Thank you for explaining that. Um, I know you're also going to be offering a second course, which is also a new course this spring. So this course is an elective in the Expressive Arts Certificate Program, and it's called The Creative Woman. Can you tell me a little bit more about the course and again, why it's particularly timely today? Hmm. Well, first of all, I have always looked at creative women as trailblazers and innovators and really guides for me in terms of expanding my thinking and expanding my ways of interacting with the world and interacting with my own artwork. And I feel that creative women in general uh, are, as I said, trail, trailblazers and they challenge in ways that are men artists, male artists do too, but there's so much um, constriction for women that a creative woman pushes through that and um, is undeterred with their, uh, their vision and their art. And so they've been guides for me. And I also think that creative women, whatever modality of art they use, uh, is this is a challenge us to, to look and feel and think differently. And one of the things that they do is they create their own stories and their own myths. And I'm looking at creative with these incredible artists, but that they've also created a new myth for us to understand and follow. I'm taking four women. Um, none of them are living 
right now. They're all deceased. But previously, I've done workshops on Frida Kahlo, who is Mexican uh, and also European. Her father was German and her mother was indigenous. And I'm looking at another visual artist whose name is Helen Hardin, and she was part Tewa, in the United States we say Native American, part Tewa, Native American from the Southwest and Caucasian from her dad. And interestingly, um, the third woman is has a cross-cultural background and her name is Maya Darren, and she was a filmmaker um, in the 40s and 50s. And I actually discovered her through one of my clients who was a filmmaker, who said to me, I think you would just love her. So of course I looked her up, I read a book, I saw some videos on her and her, her films and did fall in love with her. And then the fourth woman is an African-American woman whose name is Catherine Dunham. And she was an anthropology and dance major and wanted to bring the West African dance back to the United States. And uh, the story about her won my heart is that in 1921, she was presenting her proposal to all these white men in suits her proposal and I thought well she's a woman after my heart and uh, she wanted to bring what we call or she called first isolation of body parts as an approach to dance and in European dance and a lot of Asian dance the body is still the hands move or in ballet the feet are moving but the torso is held still in African dance, every body part is doing something different. Your shoulders are doing this, your head might be doing this, your hips are doing something else and your feet are moving across the floor. And Catherine Dunham uh, brought that back and taught that as a, a new approach to dance from Africa. She only got to the islands, Haiti and Cuba, um, she never got to West Africa. One of her disciples, Pearl Primus, did get to Africa, but I'm not gonna concentrate on Pearl, I'll concentrate on Catherine. And I'm gonna use these four women and their creative stories and the myths that they create and weave in a Jungian approach to character style um, that's based on a book called the the matrix and meaning of character that you look at a story or a myth to understand character style. So we're going to look at their stories and myth and see that how human they were in that they had woundings, but in the Jungian sense, every wounding opens us up to some new potential. And so that's what we're going to do in that class is, go from the artist to the myth, to the wounding, to the potential and the character style. So that you can take that back and see how to use it. And also to learn from these, these women um, who have taught me a, gr a great deal. Yeah. So what would you suggest to someone that doesn't necessarily consider themselves to be an artist, but really sees the power of healing that comes from the arts and how would you suggest they move forward? Hmm. Good question. Um, I think the term artist or expressive arts therapy can be very intimidating and everyone looks at uh, the artist is over here and I'm over here and I'm not an artist or I'm not a musician or whatever. But if you look back at indigenous cultures, Everyone is an artist in, uh, I spent some time in Africa and really 
saw this in the village that I stayed in where everybody danced, everybody drummed, everybody painted, everybody uh, did batik, uh, they, cre they did jewelry, they made their own beads and then made things out of them. So everyone is considered an artist. And if you have an appreciation for the arts, the exposure to the experiential process will show you how it can change your frame of reference. Um, in neuropsychology, they talk about the neurotransmitters that get secreted when we are in pleasurable or interesting processes. So you start to feel a sense, a better sense of well-being. You can go into your traumas, but with knowing that there is a, a potential that's going to emerge from it. So all you really need in, in that first year anyway, is to be the arts and to learn about their healing potential. And then if you want to go on and get trained to share this, then you will. But it starts with your experience and it goes from there. So not to be uh, intimidated by thinking you've got to be an artist in, in, in terms of engaging in these classes, but the, the classes, the training is going to bring the artist out in you. And um, then you'll decide if you want to go on and do this as an educator or a consultant or a therapist, but you'll gain a lot. Um, and that's also the way that I teach is that I want it to be a nourishing experience for you because that's going to be the best way to feed you and to feed whatever kind of work you want to do. Well, Kate, do you have any closing words for our viewers, something we might not have touched upon in the other questions? Well, I could talk forever, so <laughs> um, there, I just want to say that I have really appreciated my work at Wheat. I have, as I mentioned, learned so much, and I'm really excited about these two classes because I this is what I do. I work with dreams. I work with all the arts. Um, creative women have been um, such teachers for me. And I think you'll get, as I mentioned, you'll get nourished. And I hope new vistas open up for you and feed you the wisdom that you need and we all need to navigate what's happening in our world. So I think you could gain a lot from this and I know I'm excited to be teaching. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We're really looking forward to these courses and to many more in the future. So thank you very much. You're welcome. I'll, I'll do it on Zoom, but I can't wait to come back. <laughs>